Welcome back to another video and this is part one of renal disorders where we're going to discuss three disorders today guys that of incontinence, urinary tract infections, and kidney stones. So we're going to start with incontinence, and this is the involuntary or uncontrolled loss of urine. Now there are many different types of incontinence, and I've listed four here to provide examples. So stress incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine due to abdominal pressure. For instance, when we cough or laugh or even sneeze, urine can leak out, and this would be referred to as stress incontinence. Also, reflex incontinence is an example, and this just refers to urine leaking out in response to nerve damage. Moving along, urge incontinence is just a strong urge to urinate, hence the word urge. And here, urine leakage is uncontrolled as well. Lastly, functionary incontinence. This refers to the impaired ability of one to get to the restroom due to the environmental factors or just their function in general. Maybe they're immobile, they can't really move that well, and this is a form of incontinence. We're going to discuss medications used in the case of incontinence. And those are going to be things such as our anticholinergics, such as ditropan and enoblex. These help by calming down the bladder when it is overactive. Anticholinergics relaxes the bladder, guys. Keep that in mind. Anticholinergics relaxes the bladder. Also, tricyclic antidepressants such as tofranil can be used, and these medications decrease the contractility of the bladder. Now, alpha adrenergic blockers, these medications end in sin, such as tamsolacin and alfuzacin. And these are for men with something termed BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is an increased size of the prostate gland. So the enlarged prostate will block urine flow and alpha adrenergic blockers will shrink the prostate gland. That's why they're given. They're going to shrink the prostate gland to furthermore facilitate proper urinary elimination, urine flow out of the body. And alpha adrenergic blockers also will promote urethral relaxation. Now, the non-pharmacological approach in handling incontinence starts with skin care and odor control. The skin care due to urine possibly getting on the patient, furthermore deteriorating the skin. Remember guys, urine is acidic and it will cause skin breakdown, something called IAD, which stands for incontinence associated dermatitis. Also, exercises such as Kegel exercises are done, which are going to strengthen the urinary sphincter muscle, which helps hold in urine. So throughout this video, if you do need to urinate, just do some Kegel exercises and hold tight. Or you can just pause the video and go to the bathroom. Anyway, another non-pharmacological approach is that of CIC, which is clean intermittent catheterization. And this is going to manage incontinence and provide intermittent catheterizations. Now, this is to be done intermittently, guys, because using catheters for too long can cause a urinary tract infection, also termed a CAUTI, C-A-U-T-I, a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. So we're going to want to monitor for UTIs during this period. Now, surgical management will just serve to tighten up and provide support to the pelvic floor muscles and procedures such as suburethral slings and artificial urinary sphincter implementations will provide that tightening up and support. Next, we are going to talk about UTIs, urinary tract infections, and these occur more in females than males. Now, they are characterized by bacteria that enters the sterile bladder, which can cause inflammation, and risk factors are things such as sexual activity, diabetes, poor hygiene, as well as catheterizations that are inserted for long periods as we just discussed. So with Foley catheters, there is a high risk for UTIs that CAUTI, the CAUTI catheter associated urinary tract infection, and when hanging the bag of the catheter, we want to hang it below the bladder, which serves to prevent backflow of urine back into the bladder, which can cause that inflammation and infection. So we're gonna wanna hang it below we're going to make gravity play out here. We do not want any backflow back into the urinary bladder. Now, UTIs are infections of the lower urinary tract. Okay, keep that in mind. The lower opposite of a UTI is another disorder that we're going to discuss in part two of this presentation, which is pyelonephritis. And pyelonephritis is the upper urinary tract infection. So UTI is lower. That U in UTI, just think under, lower. Okay. All righty. Now, clinical manifestations of UTIs are things related to infection. So there will be bladder irritability, dysuria, that pain upon urination, also frequency may be seen, and urgency, the need to urinate constantly. Hematoria may be seen as well, depending on the infection, and this is blood within the urine, and microhematoria is small amounts of blood in the urine, microhematoria. 
and that will only be seen in laboratory testings guys it won't really be seen when you do urinate lastly suprapubic pain may be manifested and this points to infection and discomfort now when choosing an antibiotic a culture and sensitivity test must be done to see what antibiotic will exactly be used now the urine culture will describe the bacteria type while the sensitivity part will tell us what antibiotic should be used okay so culture is going to show the bacteria and the sensitivity is the antibiotic so management starts with antimicrobial therapy which is going to eliminate microorganisms that may be present such as the bacteria ciprofloxacin and bactrim are examples and lastly pyridium and pyridium is a urinary analgesic so it's going to reduce or prevent that dysuria that pain upon urination now pyridium turns urine orange so we're going to want to educate the patient on that in case they freak out when they see that orange urine also with the antimicrobial therapy or antibiotic therapy we're going to want to inform these patients to take the full dose of their antibiotic to prevent drug resistance so say the antibiotic is to be taken for two weeks, which is 14 days, and the client misses a day where they do not take the antibiotic, or just say they miss a couple of days. Eventually, there can be a buildup of drug resistance, and the bacteria within the body will be used to, will be familiar with the antibiotic, furthermore making it more difficult to go away. And this can also cause the reappearance or exacerbation of the disorder. So we're going to want to tell them to stick to that antibiotic therapy, take the full dose, take the full therapy for the two weeks or whatsoever duration they are on. Now, surgical management, if any is present, we're going to want to remove any kidney stones that may be causing the UTI, the bleeding or the pain. Also, if BPH is a cause in males, the removal of the prostate will assist in therapy. In nursing management, we're going to want to monitor the temperature of the patient, checking for a fever to see if any infection is present. And if there is a fever, that means the UTI has now become pyelonephritis because pyelonephritis is a complication of UTIs. And if a fever is present, this means pyelonephritis. In UTIs, there is not a fever. Once you do contract a fever from a UTI, it's not a UTI anymore. It is now classed as pyelonephritis, guys, okay? Also, we're going to want to evaluate the pain status, that pain upon urination, dysuria. Also, checking the urine characteristics are important as well because we want to make sure therapy is being therapeutic. No signs of blood or color and odor abnormalities. We don't want to see any of that. Interventions are going to focus on the monitoring of vital signs as well as doing the abdominal examinations. Administering medications as needed and providing education to the patient is going to be very important as well. We're going to want to tell them about everything. Now, education here is going to focus on the prevention of UTIs, and you could tell them to wipe front to back when cleaning themselves and also urinating before and after sexual activity. And here we have urolithiasis, which is another term for kidney stones, okay, urolithiasis. Specifically, stones are lodged within the ureters, hence the prefix uro, okay? There's also nephrolithiasis, that would be in the nephrons, guys. Now, kidney stones are characterized by calcified deposits that form in the urinary tract. Risk factors pertain to family history, as well as a diet that is high in sodium and calcium. So hypercalcemia and hypernatremia side effects can be kidney stones. Dehydration is also another risk factor in acquiring kidney stones. And this pertains to that same hypernatremia because in hypernatremia, there is more than likely dehydration. Clinical manifestations pertain to severe pain due to the stones as well as evident hematuria within urine, that blood within urine. Nausea and vomiting will be manifested as well. Now guys, remember pain is a symptom that will evoke other symptoms or responses. When we have pain, depending on where the pain is, there will be sweat, depending on how much pain there is. There will be heart palpitations increase, tachycardia, okay? And our respirations will also increase. That is tachypnea. So we have tachycardia, tachypnea, possible sweating, possible hypotension. And remember, depending on the pain level, these manifestations will be manifested. So when discussing urolithiasis, a CAT scan can be used. And remember, it is the most optimal diagnostic test when looking at structures within kidneys or within a specific part of the body. Also, that CUB can be done along with the ultrasound. The CUB is the kidneys, ureters, and bladders x-ray. And all of these are going to help identify if any stones are present. 
the medical management is to treat the symptoms, so providing that pain management is vital here. We're going to want to understand the patient's pain level using the pain scale 1 to 10, and depending on the level, this will point to the medication to start with. So narcotics are things such as dilaudid and morphine. These are for severe pain. NSAIDs are implemented as well to also provide pain relief. This is things such as acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Lastly, providing medications to reduce nausea is going to be implemented as well, such as Zofran, Phenogram, and even Reglan. These are anti-emetics. The surgical management for kidney stones can be things such as ureteroscopy, which involves a scope going through the urethra and the bladder to locate and get rid of the stones. Also, and significantly important, a extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is a route to go, and it is very beneficial in getting kidney stones out of the body. And this ESWL, which is the abbreviation for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, this treatment will pretty much shock, send shock waves constantly through the kidney and the reverberation furthermore breaks down the kidney stones into smaller ones, evacuating them upon urination. And when urinating, we are going to want to strain the urine. Now ESWL is contraindicated in pregnant females and bleeding disorders, guys, so keep that in mind. Here's a close-up view on the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And there you can see the blue wave lines that are pulsing at the level of a kidney stone, furthermore breaking it down into smaller pieces. This also will make urine pass more easily through the ureters and not leave any backed up urine in either the bladder or the ureters. Because kidney stones occlude urine flow as well as flow of waste products that need to get out of the body. And remember, backed up urine can cause UTIs and furthermore is classified as urinary stasis. When urine is not being excreted, it will sit there can cause a UTI, guys. Now, due to the pain, we're going to want to put on an EKG machine to monitor the heart and respiratory rate to prevent cardiac and respiratory abnormalities such as the tachycardia and tachypnea. So normal heart rate is anywhere from 60 to 100, and the normal respiration rate is anywhere from 12 to 20 respirations per minute. Now let's discuss some catheters, guys. Catheters may be used in the case of kidney stones, and there are a few of them to choose from. Examples listed are straight catheters, suprapubic catheters, and external catheters, also termed condom catheters. Now the straight catheters are inserted directly through the urethra and they go to the bladder and it is used intermittently, meaning it's not used for long periods. Using this for long periods, again guys, can cause a UTI, also termed a cauti, a catheter associated urinary tract infection. Next, the suprapubic catheters, on the other hand, are used for individuals that have a blocked urethra. This is a catheter that is surgically placed through the skin to the bladder. Lastly, external condom cats, which are for males, they are usually used for individuals that are not in control of their bladder. They are involuntarily losing urine. Now, when educating individuals with kidney stones, discussing dietary replacement is going to be important. So we're going to want to tell them to avoid foods that are high in oxalates. And oxalates are forms of salts, guys. Now, oxalates that can cause kidney stones are foods such as chocolate or coffee. The caffeine within coffee is a form of oxalates. Now, too much of it can lead to urolithiasis. Also, education on a diet high in sodium or calcium is going to be vital because, remember, both can lead to kidney stones. A lot of sodium will lead to dehydration. Furthermore, increase in lab values and concentration of particles, and they can eventually calcify forming stones. We're also going to want to tell these individuals to increase their fluids throughout the day to properly hydrate the body and excrete wastes and substances. To prevent that dehydration, guys, we're going to want to tell them to stay hydrated. Also, increase in citrate within the diet is going to help dissolve or break down stones, furthermore ridding them from the body. And we're going to stop this video here. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Please follow this video up with Renal Disorders 2. And in that video, we are going to discuss disorders such as polycystic kidney disease, pyelonephritis, acute glomerular nephritis, and renal cancer. So I'll see you guys then.